I am Steve Stroh. My amateur radio call sign is N8GNJ. There is no real significance to that particular call sign, only that it was better than my originally issued call sign, which was KA8WCL. That sucked. So I upgraded to technician. I was eligible for a shorter call sign, what's called a one by three. And I took it and I've used it ever since. Uh, let's see. Uh, welcome to Linux Fest Northwest. And I've been coming to Linux Fest for decades. In fact, it's one of the reasons why my wife and I now live in uh, Bellingham here, because we kind of fell in love with Bellingham after coming up so many times, and it was just such a very nice city, and we now live in the hinterlands between Bellingham and Ferndale. So I call it Bellingdale. Okay, did I miss anything? Okay, so, and this talk is about open source principles in use in amateur radio. <coughs> Basically, there is something there for you to play with, and I'm gonna throw a lot of stuff at you, not just about Linux. Um, this is a glancing blow presentation. Things are gonna fly by fast. Don't worry about it. If you have questions, I'm happy to, and I will post my email at the end. And <laughs> these are one person's opinionated opinions. So please don't take offense if your particular favorite amateur radio activity. And I'm not gonna talk about classic amateur radio as in what you can do, all of your privileges, all the potential, all of the various facets of the hobby. I'm gonna talk about the stuff that's interesting to me as a techie. Uh, and I also won't mention Linux much by name, uh, but it's there. It, it, is, it is absolutely integral to so many things. It's just part of the plumbing. So it's, it's um, not worth mentioning, except it certainly is worth mentioning. And this is me. My primary interest is, has always been data communications on amateur radio because data communications and I can play with it. Um, I am also curious about space and microwave and HF in that order. Um, space is gonna be a big deal with me in the next few years as I get various things on the line. We've only lived in Bellingham for about three years and we've, my wife and I are finally getting our house and my big shop, which I call NAGNJ Labs, in order to be able to do useful things now that the infrastructure is finished. Um, my main gig right now, and it's not a gig, it's a passion project that partially pays back, uh, is a newsletter called Zero Retries. And if you like what I talk about here, you're gonna love Zero Retries. If you don't like so, this, Zero Age tries not so much. Hmm. Oh, excuse me. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay, now it's centered. Wasn't showing all the all of the slide. Um, there's no there's there's one actionable thing that I want you to take away from this talk. Don't call us hammers or hamsters or hammies. We are amateur radio operators or hams. That's my, that is my preference in order, but never the other three. It's your only homework. <laughs> um, amateur radio, in my opinion, was the original open source community because everything got shared. There was no professional, there was no proprietary radio anything back when amateur radio got started. There was amateur radio before there was licensed radio services. And licensed radio got ser services only started because the Titanic went down and people started jamming the Titanic's transmissions. Something had to be done. Order had to be brought out of chaos. So the Federal Radio Commission was created, which became the FCC, and the rest is history. Um, just to give you a an idea that this talk is going to be a little different, that's an amateur radio. Happens to be the source is a Raspberry Pi Pico with a little bit of circuitry to clean up the transmission, but it's, as you, as you pointed out, it's vibrating an I.O. pin at the right frequency with the right modulation all being done, all the, and that waveform is determined entirely in software. And it's transmitting useful data, not just a beacon, just, not just a dumb beacon. This is also an amateur radio. This happens to be a Wi-Fi travel router with 
firmware that got flashed to use a system called Arden, which I will talk about. This is also an amateur radio because it's software defined. So you can make it do things on amateur radio frequencies, amateur radio modes, everything. This is another amateur radio. Um, this particular one is a packaged transmitter. You literally configure it with your call sign, plug it in, go put it away somewhere, and then you get to watch once a day where it's been heard literally all over the world on less than a watt of power because of the power of open source software. This is another one. Now this isn't so much of an open source project, this is a very proprietary product, but you can see how big it is. This, this guy decided, why do, we, why do I need to sacrifice the amount of space for a speaker, uh, you know, when you've got Bluetooth? So, it uses Bluetooth to communicate. And it also does very good data. So, um, it's no surprise for those of you who haven't heard much about amateur radio in the current context of what I'm going to be talking about, because the big org that's supposed to be representing U.S. and promoting U.S. amateur radio isn't exactly hip and happening in the you know, 21st century here. They've still kind, of, kind of stuck in the 20th century, mid-20th century, actually. Publishing magazines. Ooh. Uh, let's see, with some exceptions, and now there is some exceptions. Hackaday is doing a great job of promoting amateur radio. They just... It's just part of their mix. It's just fantastic. Um, there's a, a few YouTubers. There's a lot of YouTubers talking about amateur radio. There's a few YouTubers that are talking about what I consider zero retrites interesting subjects, which I, which I promote in my newsletter every week. Uh, there's the GNU Radio Conference, which also has a very good attendance from hams and almost always now at least several presentations talking about amateur radio in the context of using GNU Radio. And DEF CON. Uh, ham Radio is a very big presence now at DEF CON uh, in the Ham Radio Village, which got spun out of DEF CON into an independent organization. Uh, if you like doing Morse code, it's cool, it's interesting, you can still do that. It's, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the way that amateur radio used to be done. It's just not that interesting to the younger generation. If we don't get more bodies coming in the door, getting licensed, the service, the amateur radio service is just going to go away. Um, bit of bragging. Ethernet was invented, co-invented by an amateur. Hayes modems were co-invented by an amateur radio operator. And if you're a boater, you live and die by AIS. That was invented by amateur radio. Uh, this was this is a fun quote that I picked up at a conference. Um, so amateur radio has their own satellites, and one of the satellites was going to go into the was going to go into an elliptical orbit where it was going to get behind the const above the constellation of GPS satellites, and they were going to put a GPS receiver because they could, and they went to somebody had a contact at the Air Force and went to the Air Force and says, "What's the radiation pattern?" on the back side of your satellites. And says, Can't tell you that. That's classified. But we would really love it if you would share your data with us afterwards. Because they didn't know either. <laughs> um, this is another fun one picked up at a conference. Uh, Microsoft, when they were thinking about creating MSN as a dial-up modem pool back in the day, uh, they didn't think TCP IP would work because 1,200 baud modems are too slow. And a ham in the room, literally in the room, piped up and said, I do 1,200 baud TCP IP all day on my ham radio station. We can do it with modems. I can tell you something cool about me in amateur radio is that I got my first sysadmin, netadmin job at Boeing because I knew TCP IP. I only knew TCP IP because I was an amateur radio operator. I could be playing with it long before the internet was a thing for consumer access. Uh, amateur radio in space, we, boy do we do space. We're, we're well over 100 total satellites that have gone into orbit exclusively or in part having amateur radio payloads. Um, one of them is still in orbit above geosynchronous orbit above Africa, giving the Europeans and the Asians and everybody on that hemisphere 
access to the cool, one of the cooler playgrounds that I wish, and I wish we had one, we don't. Maybe we will get one. Uh, Japan's moon lander that landed on its side had an amateur radio transmitter on it, meaning it was transmitting in amateur radio mode on amateur radio frequencies. And we bounce signals off the moon because we can. It's hard, but we can do it. The way we used to do it is we would put up these enormous antennas with like 20 uh, circularly polarized antennas on one axis and a kilowatt of power, 1,000 watts of power on VHF and UHF and just blast as far as we could. And we had to have these receivers. Some, one, one of our more eccentric and uh, talented folks, would, when he wanted to work uh, moon bounce, he would go top up his liquid oxygen supply so he could cool down his preamplifier so he would be more sensitive. True story. Uh, what do we do? This is what the FCC says we do. These are the current regulations. The two that leap out um, are um, voluntary non-commercial -commer communication service, particularly regarding emergency communications, and international goodwill. The other three, B, C, and D, we'll talk about that in a second. So MCOM, for served agencies like the Red Cross, like cities, counties, et cetera, um, that's going away for amateur radio. We're getting older. We, still show, we tend to show up with portable radios or mobile radios, and they want internet. They, you know, they, they want their normal services you know, in an emergency situation. And now they can. FirstNet is hardened cellular service through AT&T, through a government contract. This is true hardened services with true priority, unlike past um, attempts at providing emergency. Iridium satellite, you might have heard of. Uh, they have a fantastic new constellation. Iridium's just blinking amazing. And of course, the new kid on the block, Starlink, is just stealing everything in sight. Um, and you, you, roll, you roll in, you turn it on. The new, my, when I bought my Starlink two years ago now, it had a motor, azimuth elevation motor, that tuned itself to the right position in the sky. The new ones don't even have motors. Ours, you just point. Just, it's, it, yeah. it, it, it moves itself. But it, it, that's the older one. The new ones don't have that. Yeah, ours is. It, well, no, okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Ours has got a heater and it melts the snow when it snows. Yes, and, it, and, it, and cats love it. You know. yeah. Of course, the cats Our sterile cats. afterwards. But. Yeah, we have, cat. we have new cats now that we never had before because they love the Starlink. So anyway, Starlink is MCOM of this era. And, uh, you know, it's, it's broadband. Not to, I, I should have put the... I did, a, I did a test last year uh, during, concurrent with what's called Amateur Radio Field Day. I took, I called it Meadow Day because I didn't want it confused that there was anything about amateur radio about it. I picked up my Starlink system, put it in the middle of my yard, put a solar panel on, battery bank, laptop, headset, et cetera. And I did video calls all over the US over you know, the course of three hours in what I would consider emergency conditions. I wasn't yeah. dependent on any commercial power. We're all uh, solar too. Yeah. Everything, yeah. So, you know, it just, it just works. Um, in that international goodwill thing, we used to be able, the only way that a person from the USSR and a person from the US could communicate directly without negotiating with the government, pre-agreed. Pre you couldn't call USSR on the phone unless you were like a business or you had a agreement in place with the US government. Now, we've got the internet. International goodwill at scale. <coughs> These are the three things that I agree with the FCC that we should be, we are doing. We are, create, we are advancing the state of the radio art. One of the ways that we are advancing the state of the radio art is we're innovating in the space that commercial folks left behind long ago. 
the VHF, UHF bands with narrow channels. We're doing amazing stuff there. Um, we're doing stuff that the commercial guys can't do because we're doing things like we're, you know, slaving a fairly powerful computer to a, <laughs> to a radio and nobody's going to do that, but we've got power to burn. It's just sitting there, so why not use it? Um, advancing skills. I'll talk more about that. And expanding the existing reservoir of trained operators, technicians, and electronics. Not what we used to do, but what we can do now. And I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, we experiment and we learn. We build. We can build our own stuff, including stuff from scratch that doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, and learn. We can communicate and share ideas and learn. And we have fun and, and learn some more. Picking up on a theme here. Okay. Software defined radio has changed everything. It just, it, it basically nuked the way we used to do things. Except for the very, very low end where people like making really minimal radios. That's still a thing. Um, these are some of the technologies that just changed everything. And, not, and these aren't all of them. Did I put? Yeah, powerful, cheap computers. Yep, that was the big one. Um, we've, the amateur radio used to be at a disadvantage because everything had shifted into chipsets that we didn't have access to because they were designed for cellular quantities and only for professional engineers. Um, things like that. So we were falling further and further behind the technology curve for experimenting. You could still buy cool radios, you could buy cool radios, but you couldn't make your own. But once we got into the software domain, we caught up because we have lots of guys with software expertise in amateur radio. And a lot of times when amateur radio manufacturers say that they're using software-defined radio, they mean we're able to do this cheaper using a fast computer software and some fast I.O. than designing the actual physical components. But we're not going to let you guys dink with it. We sell you a radio with fixed function. We call it SDR, but it's not really. Um, there are many, many Soft open source projects in amateur radio, and I'm just going to blur through these. So, If there's one that you think is really cool, ask. Uh, one of the first, especially, was uh, K9Q Net and NOS. This was not the first TCPIP stack for DOS, but it was the first free one, and it was absolutely the first open source one. So Phil published, Phil built, Phil got tired of proselytizing, evangelizing uh, the values of TCPIP and amateur radio. Everybody said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Phil said, all right, fine, I'll do it. So Phil sat down and wrote. Phil is a, was an early employee at Qualcomm. He's responsible, essentially, for having the internet in your phone. I'm not joking. I can explain more about that if you like. And so he wrote this stack, this TCPIP stack for DOS. And he put some drivers into it that worked with amateur radio hardware. And uh, that was the, and we used it here in the Seattle area. We built a network consisting of five repeaters that all ran TCP IP at 1,200 and 9,600 bits per second. And, it, and NOS predated Linux. Um, and it worked. It, it worked fantastically. This is, and this is the stuff that I learned on to get my job at Boeing. Um, Linux from the very from early, because hams were there, um, had AX.25 drivers, and AX.25 is the most proto most common protocol in use for amateur radio data communications. Um, it is a complete network stack, just doesn't have anything to do with TCP/IP. Um, so the cool thing about that was that we could the the Linux folks you know could start using their usual mail utilities and web browsers, et cetera, on amateur radio systems with no apologies. You know, AX25 devices were first-class citizens within Linux. Um, 
Codec 2 is a codec is a coder decoder, um, basically a voice digitization system. There are hundreds of different approaches on how to do that, and every blinking one of them got patented. And for in the early days of the digital transformation into the into the uh, cellular network, everything, every conceivable approach, we we. Amateur Radio actually commissioned a study. There was nothing, there were no chinks in the armor. It was all patented. So, but if you wait, 17 years later, patents run out. And we get better processors, so we now have our own uh, codec called Codec 2, which is optimized for all the things that we do with Amateur Radio, including our HF bands. Um, more detail. And Best of all, it's available as software for you to do whatever you want instead of having to work around embedding a chip, which is actually a digital signal processor, which is running, wait for it, software, but it's proprietary and you can only use that company's proprietary software by embedding a chip. Let's see, so Codec 2 is used for digital voice on the HF bands through a system called FreeDV. And it's used on the amateur radio VHF UHF bands on a system called M17. And both of these projects are very, very open source, very active, very well maintained, and constantly evolving. Um, packet radio. Yep. Have you got any info on, on where one can find out about that? I'm, I'm going to publish these slides, and I'm going to publish, and, and I'm going to put hyperlinks in all of them. I just did not have time to put all the hyperlinks in. Um, so, Packet Radio was created, or Amateur Packet Radio was created in Montreal, Quebec, in the early '80s, if, if I've got my timeline right. It was then, sorry, late '70s, I believe. Uh, then it, then the progress moved over to Vancouver, our buddies up north. Um, and they really got it done. They created what was called then TNC, Terminal Node Controller, because everybody had dumb terminals, so you needed to put the intelligence in the modem instead of the, because you didn't have it on the desktop. Um, and then, but they were a small group, um, very good hardware for the time. Um, and then a group in Tucson, Arizona, called Tapper, which originally stood for Tucson Amateur Packet Radio. Now, that's not applicable. They're not in Tucson anymore, and they don't do packet radio, so they just call themselves Tapper. Um, they popularized packet radio, and amateur radio, um, by creating a device called the TNC-1 and then the TNC-2. And the story goes that when they opened the, on a Monday morning, the Tucson uh, telephone switch crashed. There was so much incoming traffic, didn't have rope, they, they couldn't accommodate it. And it was because of the TNC2. That's the story I've been told. Uh, tap, as part of the development, they did the AX25 packet radio specification, um, and they licensed the entire design for the TNC2. They, they, they made several runs of it, and they said, and, every, and so many manufacturers came to them and said, I just want to buy it and make it myself. So they did. For the first couple of years of the packet radio revolution, they, there, there were TNC2 clones and a few independent developments, and then it started branching out from there. Um, and the big claim to fame for Tapper that you might not otherwise know about them if you aren't involved in amateur radio is they created what's called the Tapper Open Hardware License. It was, it was, the, first, it was the first open source license applied to hardware that I'm aware of. Um, so, software-defined radio, it's basically a big A to D converter and a D to A converter that has enough bandwidth to be able to attach an antenna to it. What comes in, digitized, sent to the computer, and everything else is software. It's a little more complicated coming out. The software designs the waveform, spits it out to the digital to analog converter, varying waveforms, and then it has to get filtered because Digital systems create spurious signals in addition to the one you intend. It's just an artifact of doing it digitally. 
So you got to filter that out a little bit. And then you got to boost the power a bit. But otherwise, it's that simple, conceptually. Uh, software defined receivers are easy now. Uh, those are just chipsets that are off the shelf. Software defined transceivers are a little harder, um, but still pretty easy. Um, software defined trans or, sorry, software defined transceivers for HF um, are fair or easy, easier. Doing the same thing for VHF, UHF is hard, much harder. And then the real trick is to get usable power output at VHF, UHF. That's still a work in progress. And these, <laughs> I'm going to try and fly through these. Direwolf, my favorite software TNC. I have no idea why he's called Direwolf, except he must have been a fan of Game of Thrones. Um, and this is an amazing thing. So he basically recreated the equivalent of a TNC firmware in, in software. And then he says, OK, what else we got? So one of the things, one of the issues of packet radio is that it's a very simple system for detecting errors. It does a checksum. And if the receiving station calculates a checksum and it's different than what it was transmitted, it says, oh, throw it away. Have you retransmit? So on a really noisy channel, that get, that's a lot of overhead. He says, well, I've got this system sitting here 99.9% .9 underutilized doing this function. So what else can I do it? So he randomly st he started flipping every bit to see if the checks unfixed. And lo and behold, boy, did that bring the efficiency of the check. It's much more sensitive than a hardware TNC. Um, then he said, OK, what else we got? Well, there was this paper written to develop a, a version of AX25 which could incorporate compatible forward error correction called FX25, Forward Error Correction X to AX2.25. I said, so he threw that in, worked great, brought the channel utilization up even higher, and it permitted higher speeds that were problematic, much very problematic with hardware TNCs. And then he threw in a second one that was experimental and only existed in one other piece of hardware, and then faster speeds, faster, faster, faster. Uh, WSJTX, this is, this is blanking amazing. This is the system that is behind um, weak signal propagation recorder, whisper. This is the one where you can twiddle the pin, transmit, and be literally be heard all over the world because of the incredible digital signal process. It might help to understand how good this is, that it was developed by, I am not joking, a Nobel laureate named Dr. Joe Taylor. We used to do deep space stuff. He's an astrophysicist. I'm not getting that right, but close enough. Uh, M17 project, brainchild of a ham, ham radio operator in Poland. Um, he decided that he was tired of dealing with proprietary codecs and other proprietary stuff to do digital voice on VHF, UHF. So he started doing it on his own. Fumbled around for a while, a few years, but then he got a grant. Now he's working on this full time, making amazing progress. And now we can run, and we'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how you can run M17 over a conventional repeater with one <coughs> modification. He's developing radio hardware now. The remote radio unit is a really cool thing. I should have included a picture of this. It's the idea of putting the radio on the tower. And he's, he figured out that you can get custom die-cast cases from China cheap. So, <laughs> so he's building the hardware, and he's heat sinking it. There are no fans, no moving parts, no nothing. So and this thing is going to transmit 50 watts just underneath the antennas. So there's no feed line loss. Then he's going to run the data down the, down the tower on fiber, and he's going to push up, I don't know what voltage, probably 24 or 48 volts, um, and get it done. And that's a game changer. Nobody else is doing that. Nobody else is doing Oh, and it's going to be a repeater that does M17 and FM. Uh, OpenHT is literally a software-defined transceiver in the size of a portable, complete with screen, complete with keyboard, complete with DSPs, all that stuff. He's doing that. You're not getting that stuff from corporate amateur radio. 
one individual with a, with a pretty good grant. Um, Amateur Radio Digital Emergency Network. This is firmware based on OpenWRT that is, has features specific to amateur radio. The packet headers include your call sign. Uh, it, it deliberately doesn't have encryption. Um, it auto configures the DNS, the IP addresses, whole bunch of stuff, oh, and the mesh, of course, um, all, all automatically. You just basically start throwing up nodes and you can start communicating. HamWAN is the local equivalent, the, the homegrown alternative. In addition, in contrast to Arden, it's not a mesh network. Well, it is a mesh network, but it's a static mesh network. It was it's an engineered network. They design all of the links between the nodes uh, very carefully. Um, it's available. It works. It's great. And in Bellingham, the local HamWAN node is up on Lookout Mountain. Easy, you know, just basically look south. If you can see mountains, you're probably going to hit it. SATNOGS, satellite. Originally, it was satellite network, open ground station. Um, this is a stack of hardware that consists of a Raspberry Pi, a cheap SDR, a rotor, which most of which you can make the components uh, with your 3D printer, um, and you buy a stepper motor and a little bit of electronics, and you can put your own, you know, you can create your own ground station which is so cool. And it's receive only, so anybody can do it. It's not limited to amateur radio. Um, and it's a great STEM project. And, and you will help out uh, satellite builders at universities because you, you don't get to launch a satellite and use amateur radios just purely for fun. You have to do some useful science. That qualifies you for the cheap launches on Star, on, um, SpaceX and NASA. So, 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 some of these research satellites literally get thrown out the door of the space station. They're, they're, they're only about this big. And then they're in orbit. Uh, DigiPi is based on a Raspberry Pi 02W. Um, it's designed to kind of sit in the corner and do its thing all by itself. Um, it connects to your radio, but you don't have to put the radio on a desk, put the computer on a desk next to the radio, et cetera. This is all one little unit, easily within my hand. Um, it's just amazing project, all open source. Um, and then DVM, this is the really cool one. This is originally designed to give repeaters a, the ability to, FM repeaters, the conventional ones that we've had forever, um, the ability to pass digital voice, um, which is incompatible, normally incompatible with an FM repeater. Um, it's a little, essentially a modem, a computer, and it digitizes it and redigitizes it. Um, and then now there's a mode called MMDVM TNC that's still in development, but this may be, make it possible for us to use data over a repeater seamlessly with all the other things it's doing. If it, for example, you can pro program it to have priority for FM communications if somebody wants to use it for voice, it will prioritize that over the data. And the data will say, oh, I'll wait. That would be really cool. GNU Radio. Uh, if you haven't heard of GNU Radio, you should. If you're the least bit curious about radio stuff, check out GNU Radio. It is just amazing. It's, it's an environment all to itself. Um, and there's a lot of stuff about amateur radio baked into GNU radio. Um, if you, you know, first, you know, in, with a computer, the first thing you port to it is make sure it runs Linux. With a radio, an open source radio, first thing you do is make sure it runs GNU radio. Uh, digital library of amateur radio and communications. This is a favorite project of mine. My wife really loves DLARC because it's literally, I've literally sent hundreds of pounds of paper out of my shop. Um, to this project. It's been digitized. It's now online. Um, stuff, I had stuff that apparently nobody else had. So it's now online for everybody to use, uh, except for the big U.S. amateur radio organization. They're real idiots about this, but we're working on it. ARDC, Amateur Radio Digital Communications. These are the guys that own their own 
um, Class A address space just because they asked for it back in the day. Well, we wanted TCP IP and internet stuff sounds pretty cool and amateur radio loves doing things that are pretty cool. So they wandered down and talked to John Pastel and John Pastel said, oh, we'll just give you a Class A. So 16 million IPv4 addresses. Uh, fast forward 30 plus years, uh, we aren't using all that, all of that, probably not even half of it, um, actually. So they sort of sold a quarter of it, and they can't tell you that they sold it to Amazon, but if you go into the records, it's obvious that they sold it to Amazon, and they made more than $100 million on it. They turned around and took that money and put it into very good investments, and now ARDC is calving off more than $5 million annually. Um, the vast, vast majority of it goes to grants. Uh, they are required, their particular structure as an organization requires them to divest themselves of 5% of their uh, endowment um, every year. So that's what they do, and they give it away. And um, they do, they're doing amazing things. And my, for one, one example that's near and dear to my heart is that the original weather radar system was developed on the MIT campus. It was put on top of a building, a 22-story building, if memory serves, called the Green Building, and that was like in the 70s. And once they finished developing the system, they were done with the hardware, so they walked away from it, and the you know, facilities was gonna take it down. It says, no, we don't want that thing up there. And the ham radio club said, oh, we, we, we play with it. So the ham radio club has been doing moon balance on very, a lot of other stuff. Um, but fast forward 30 years from then, it's getting very long in the tooth. The roof needs to be refurbished. The, the radome had to come down. And the ham radio club said, well, they, and they weren't going to put it back. The ham radio club said, well, what would it take to get it back? He says, well, a lot of money. He says, well, we might be able to raise a lot of money. He said, huh? So kept asking for a number. Finally, it came, the number, I think, was 1.1 million. And they said, ugh. So everybody thought that was the end of that. But they went to ARDC, came away with a big grant that basically covered what they hadn't raised from the alumni. And so that radome COVID caused it to take a hit on the schedule, but it's going back up. And the MIT techies are going to be playing with space for a good long time. Thank you to ARDC. Um, and full disclosure, I used to uh, be a volunteer for them. Um, I, I worked on the Grants Advisory Committee for two years. Eventually, I had to divest myself of them because I was getting a little too outspoken in my newsletter, and uh, they didn't like that. So we decided to part amicably, and I, I have the utmost respect for them. They're doing fantastic work. Um, I love them. One, but again, their start was this Class A address space, um, and out of that they've created what's called 44Net, which is IPv4 addresses. You can have a lot of them, or a few of them if you want, if you're an amateur radio operator and adhere to their terms of use, uh, and not for commercial use. And a lot of hams are doing this stuff for their home labs. Uh, I could keep going. <laughs> <laughs> CATS, brand new system using FSK instead of audio frequency shift keying. Kiwi SDR, this is a web server with a radio. So I just have to plug this thing in, do a little bit of configuration to let it out through my LAN, and you, anybody in the world can use my radio receiver at my house. It was called a Kiwi SDR2, it was about $400. But it's, the cool thing is, it's its own web server. You don't need any other hardware, no host computer or anything. The, there's this and the browser on the other end. That's the system. Oh, and of course the aggregation gateway if you choose to share yours as part of the group. Uh, Hamsi, uh, these guys are amazing. Based out of Scr uh, University of Scranton, they're doing amazing stuff. They're getting students involved in actual science using amateur radio. Bloom tracking, we have the largest network of position receivers. One for, well, at least here in the US, it's one, everybody's listening to 145.33 for 
anybody who chooses to be in their position. Okay, now we get to the meat of it. What's in it for you? Why do you care? Why should you care? It's literally, getting an amateur radio, radio license is literally, and I don't mean that figuratively, I mean it literally. It's a license to experiment with radio technology in ways that you can't do any other way short of working for big ass corp getting special temporary authority from the FCC. They've got to do that. They've got to put a lawyer in the middle of that. We just do it because we are amateur radio operators. We, we don't have a profit motive. We're just in it for the fun and the experimentation and the knowledge. Um, we have a wide range of frequencies that literally are allocated specifically to us. Some of them we share with other services. But for example, we have an allocation in the lower half of the 2.4 gigahertz band that is, says these are amateur radio frequencies. So that means the amateur radio stuff that we like to do, like higher power, we're legal to do. The hams in Europe are pumping out like 10 watts to the, the, geo, the Q0100 satellite on 2.4 gigahertz because they can. And that's where it's designed to receive. So you can't, if you did that and you did it poorly, you will hurt people. You know, so that's that's one of the reasons why hams take tests. Oh, just letting you know, you're running into your um, Q and A time, um, and you have 20 minutes left total. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, we're getting close. Okay, uh, how do you get a license? There's a published pool of 500 questions and answers. Um, the technician test is easy for techies. It just they'll make sense. When are you allowed to interfere? Answer: Never. <laughs> um, pro tip, take the, if, once you get your technician test, and I'm sure you techies will pass the tech test, go for the general. It's part of the same uh, life, uh, test fee. You can take it. Um, and if you pass, then you get the cred of being able to operate on HF. And for a certain odious class of amateur radio operators, makes you a real ham radio operator which I have obviously no patience for. Um, you can take the test online or in person. Um, and then there's this little hoop that the government makes you go through of establishing an account on the FCC website, paying a $35 fee, then you are issued your call sign. Uh, we have a local club here in Bellingham called Mount Baker Amateur Radio Club. Uh, it's typical general interest amateur radio club, meets monthly. We have a digital group, that's the cool, that's the cool folks. Uh, we have an, they sponsor a number of FM repeaters in the area. They're gonna do field day, amateur radio field day. We go out in the field and we operate for 24 hours, supposedly independent of all power, uh, on June 22nd in Blaine. And my newsletter is zero retries. Uh, as of this Saturday, I'm like four short of 1,600 subscribers. Um, it's this, if you like this talk, that's, Zero retries and free as in beer, but if you want to throw money at me, there's an option for that. ZeroRetries.org. And this is my contact info. I actually got through 57 slides. I'm amazed. <laughs> okay, so, questions? You mentioned that um, a lot of the satellites do um, sort of broadcasting for amateur radio. How is that funded? Is that anything to do with both format or is it? It's all kinds of, a lot of them are colleges. So they, they, it's part of a class on how to build a satellite, how to launch a satellite, how to track a satellite. Um, it's, yeah, a lot of colleges, some individual groups. The Q0100 satellite was actually paid for by a wealthy patron that no one knows who. who. They basically contracted with an engineering company to put this, uh, sub, this payload on a commercial broad, direct video broadcast satellite over Africa, um, uh, everything. The, the very first Oscar one, the very first amateur radio satellite was the, has its, one of its claims to fame in the 19th, I don't remember the date, um, after Sputnik, but it was the first privately owned satellite that was not put up by a government. And so, um, and that was paid for by people's individual pockets. They put it together in garages, literally. And it operated for quite a while. Other questions? Who's convinced? Who's gonna go for it? 
Great. Nope. Mm -hmm. uh, thoughts on JS8 call? I love it. It's great. Uh, it's a lot of people don't like it because they don't consider it you know, amateur radio. But as far as I'm concerned, anything goes. I mean, if you if you enjoy it, do it. For goodness sake, there's so much spectrum, so much band time. You know, it might sound crowded. You know, at certain times of the day, but it's not that crowded, and it's not all the time. Oh, um, I was asking. So, you're talking about like packet radio and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the transport of TCP packets over um, radio. Not, not it, TCP IP can write on top of packet radio, but it's not necessary. It's it's its own protocol. Uh, well, what, I'm, what I was uh, kind of trying to clunkily ask is. Um, a lot of the modern web standards use like uh, security built in. What do you feel about um, encryption when it comes to radio? I know you can't do it, but what do you think about that? The the actual the the actual letter of the law in the FCC regulations is you are not allowed to obscure the meaning. If you intend to obscure the meaning of the transmission, that is not allowed. Obfuscation, I believe, is the word. So as far as I'm concerned, if you're not trying to do that, and it just happens to be that you're talking to a website that there's no other way to access except using a secure protocol, then go for it. I am, I am an advocate of ask for forgiveness rather than permission. <laughs> Seriously. So um, it, that's exactly what happens on Hamwen all the time. Hamwen, the links literally are not the point-to-point -point links. They disable the encryption on the link, but they're not restricting you from going out onto the big open internet accessing a website and you know returning the results if it happens to be HTTPS or secure shell or whatever. Uh, sorry, son. What about stuff like LoRaWAN and all that stuff? Oh, well, that is so cool. Well, I've, I couldn't quite get my, as an amateur radio operator, I couldn't quite get my head around the attraction of that versus getting amateur radio. And then one commenter on a podcast said, hey, I set up a LoRa, well, Laura WAN is a service, okay. uh, paid service. You know, you, if you don't pay them, you don't get to use the Laura WAN. Well, there was some sort of amateur. No, there, there's called Meshtastic, is the is the popular one now. That's and that rides on top of Laura. Laura is a very robust spread spectrum protocol, put out by a company whose name is escaping me right now. Uh, works great, and it's used for internet. It was originally developed for Internet of Things. Now it's becoming very popular from an app called Meshtastic. And it's basically forming up these, it's basically a distributed radio chat server. And for, for my purpose, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get on it and participate because it's a gateway drug to amateur radio. So yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna play. And then of course that leads to IoT and you, you know, the we, we, the thing is, we've been doing IoT. IoT was part of uh, what's called APRS, Automatic Pack Position, Automatic Packet Reporting System, and they've always had telemetry. There, there are people that whose APRS station just transmits their weather station data into the grid. So. I'm kind of curious, like, are there any common carriers? What kind of you mentioned like weather station? What kind of data do you want to normally send over radio? Yeah, like who we can talk to, like we can talk about the moon. Kind of, what do you normally, what do you like say off the moon? That that is the you don't have conversations yeah. via the moon because it is so daunting. It is so much work to get the date, get a signal back because basically it's going you know tens of thousands of miles, and then it's hitting basically a big ball of absorbent rock. So getting a reflection back off of it is really hard, especially something coherent. Now, it's easy to just send a radar pulse to it you know, and just sense the raw energy coming back. But getting something coherent, that's an amazing trick. Yeah, you use it to store data. <laughs> <laughs> True that. Um, yeah, moon, moon bounce is considered the, the technical, you know, ultimate sign of geekdom uh, when you can at, when you when your station can actually do moon bounce now it's gotten a lot easier you don't have to have the huge array of antennas you have to have a say a 22 element uh, Yagi antenna base and a hundred watt of power 
and you're using these new protocols called w, WSJT. They've, they've got various protocols for moon bounce and others, and other hard to do things that used to be hard to do things when you had to do them in hardware. Now that you can do them in software, they're getting a lot easier. So the, the cred requirement, or the, sorry, the tech requirement is going down a bit. It's still daunting, not easy. I've been having fun with uh, these uh, little chipsets. Uh, you can get uh, CC1101 as a, a sub one gigahertz uh, transceiver chip and an NR24, NRF24 L01, which is a 2.4 gigahertz transceiver chip. Yep. And it's just all self contained and uh, you get sort of an instant radio. That, that's, that is the core of a lot of new amateur radio projects, products that are the you know used to require a company yeah. used to require real design expertise but now that you can google and now you can get some ai help yeah. you know design you know okay so auto route the circuit board you know, you know this is, and you know, this says oh you need to do that for rf oh no problem yeah. it's an rf circuit board we're buying a module and you can get like a dozen of them for 10 bucks you know already oh that's sort of thing, you know, this, this friend of mine who's making hardware in his literally home workshop and one of them just shipped to me an article. He, he, he clued me in on a fun point. He said, pick a standard extruded enclosure and then when you need the end caps, don't get them made from aluminum and engraved. Get them from printed circuit board material and you know, specify. And he says, you get 50 for seven bucks. It's just amazing stuff. So, am I, am I in danger of getting evicted? Almost. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. Last question. Going once. <laughs>